We know what we are, but know not what we may be. Ophelia. Vincent knew his Hamlet, if not all of Shakespeare's work. And he knew how introspection invariably leads to the bigger percentage of our icebergs below the surface. He once wrote, there are things in the depths of our souls that would cut us to the quick if we knew about them. With rare self-deprecating humor, he once diagnosed himself as a rough and ready chromomaniac and one of the happy possessors of a disordered heart. Then displaying classic defensive paranoia, he wrote, they call a painter mad if he sees with the eyes other than theirs. One can understand how someone in rural southern France in 1888 would think that Vincent was totally le fou, the locals' nickname for him, the crazy one. But with 124 years of hindsight, maybe we can be a little more tolerant of his aberrant persona. That's not to say that today we wouldn't have had him on a lithium IV drip faster than you can say bipolar therapy maintenance. But how can you not see the piercing sanity when he talks about his own? Like a one-way journey on a train, you go fast, but cannot distinguish any object very clearly. And above all, you do not see the engine. So to return to our main query, did he know what he was doing? What are we to make of these writings? It is the excitement, the honesty of a response to nature that guides our hand. And this excitement is often so strong that one works without noticing that one is working. He wrote, I dream of painting, and then I paint my dream. But then he also wrote, I would prefer my madness to the rest of the world's sanity. And finally, I put my heart and soul into my work and have lost my mind in the process. He certainly unnerved anyone who sat for him or watched him while he was painting. Vincent would cock his head at all angles, squint, flutter his eyes incessantly, and appear to be physically attacking its canvas with fully loaded salvos of paint. Much to Vincent's continuing chagrin, most of his subjects were one and done when it came to being subjects. You can see Madame Jeannot posing for Gauguin lift her left hand as if to block out the ruckus that is Vincent, who's painting her over in the corner. Madame Roulin, the wife of one of Vincent's only friends in Arles, was one such a reluctant sitter. She actually sat for him on a number of occasions, enough for Vincent, in his increasingly pathologically lonely state, to elevate Madame R to a pinnacle of motherhood with a capital M. But when you think about something or someone, and if you concentrate on it to the exclusion of everything else, we and I mean all of us, no matter our psychological states, we can all start reading things into a situation that may not necessarily be there. But that was Vincent's standard operating procedure for almost everything. He wanted this painting of Madame R rocking her baby off screen to act as a mollifier for sailors being buffeted out at sea. This is how he envisioned a finished triptych with his sunflowers sitting in as the adoring patrons in the wings as if they had just sauntered in from a Jan Van Eyck altarpiece. They call a painter mad if he sees with eyes other than theirs. Indeed. There's a term that screenwriters use when it comes to dialogue from quirky characters. It's called left field, as in, wow, that came from out of left field. Here's an example. Character A. Hey, did you call Mo yet? Character B, oh, darn, I forgot to mow the lawn. That's how the synapses in Vincent's brain worked, as if they were sprayed with some sort of cognitive DW40. Stimulated by any least amount, his thoughts could take off on flights of free associative meaning at the drop of a hat, or a pipe, or a candle. Now, you might have heard of situational ethics as opposed to universal ethics. I believe Vincent suffered from situational imagination. He never felt comfortable painting from memory, though some of his best loved works were created that way. We'll look at Starry Night in a moment. 
he was much more engaged when confronted with the actual thing right there in front of his canvas. When it was too cold to paint the outside environs of Arl, what would Vincent do? He'd stay indoors and paint his bedroom or his shoes or his chairs. These are old chairs, but they aren't just any old chairs. See, he can't seem to stop his mind from free associating, and the chairs begin to take on elements of personification. They become their sitters, and not just something sat upon. This one's Vincent. This one's Paul. This is what I mean by situational imagination. And instead of Gauguin's mocking thumb, notice the hero worship placement of the candle on Paul's seat. Evidently, Gauguin was quite the ladies' man in Arles. I had an acting teacher who once sat us all down in the front row of the theater, put a single lone chair up on the empty stage, and then asked us, what is this? Handicapped in our literal mindedness as we were, we'd say, a chair, duh. No, what else? Give us a break, it's a chair, okay? It's a folding chair, how's that? Then he would get really frustrated with us and say, no, you idiots, it's somebody who isn't there. For the rest of the year, we'd always tell people not to squish the person who wasn't there before they sat down in an empty chair. Vincent said of his Gauguin chair, I tried to paint his empty place, the absent person. I believe he had something akin to restless leg syndrome, only replaced leg with brain. When his epileptic-esque attacks left him paralyzed or worse, shackled to his hospital bed for a month, Vincent's mind was incapable of little more than self-pity, self-loathing, and basic animal survival. Deep meaning, symbolism, they were out of the picture. Now, Theo must have seen something in the shipment after shipment of paintings coming from the South. He actually praised Iris's, saying it was a thing you are simply confronted with. Vincent countered by saying, I have no ideas. We are entering what Hamlet, had he been a painter, would have called the undiscovered country. The work is no longer representing nature. It is only presenting itself. Detail has translated into the act of pure seeing. This is the wellspring, the fountainhead, if you will, of modern art. The latter paintings that would come out of this period, slowly, one blade of grass at a time, as he'd say, are simultaneously streamlined and raw, if that is even possible. And the history of art had never seen anything like them before. I've loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. What would Vincent have made of Sotheby's auctioning off Edward Monk's The Scream for $120 million the other week? And it was just pastel on board. I suppose he could counter with his Dr. Gachet going for $88 million in 1990 and adjust it for today's dollars. Lord help us if this one ever goes on the block. I suspect if he were with us still, Vincent would be most astounded and upset by what I call the Vincent industry. I don't think he would appreciate that his work has floated a whole third world country's worth of sweatshops devoted to making Starry Night neckties. Starry Night hasn't attained the monthly Yahoo article status that the Mona Lisa has, but it's in a healthy second place. Astronomers have returned to the room at Saint-Rémy where this was painted, and through computer simulations figured out that as much as Vincent contended that he painted it from memory, he got the celestial configuration spot on, except for the phase of the moon. Poetic visual license, no doubt. Bet you didn't know that Venus was at the height of its eight-year cycle of brightness in the spring of 1889, or that Nostradamus, of all people, was born in the village depicted below Vincent's window. Or how Vincent shrunk Saint-Rémy from a town of 5,000 or so into this quaint little hamlet that's minus one Paul Revere on horseback away from being a Grant Wood painting. Okay, I think that's enough of that. I do, however, have a familiar point to make. 
sometimes it's close to impossible to give work that is so incorporated into the pop culture vernacular an unencumbered look. At the risk of getting a little too cute with this argument, we aren't the only ones that have to unload our visual baggage in order to see Starry Night. Vincent had to as well. Here's a drawing from inside Vincent's room. Actually, cell would probably be a more appropriate term, don't you think? He was not allowed out of his room at night, and after his escapades with eating oil paint alluded to earlier, his handlers were certainly not going to give him unchaperoned access to his supplies. And had Vincent not exercised a certain amount of visual editing, Starry Night might have ended up looking like this. But we all perform similar exercises every waking moment. You have heard of our blind spots caused by the missing rods and cones where our optic nerves come into the retina. Here's what actually comes between us and the image from the outside world. Blood vessels. We conveniently disregard them or see past them. Our cameras don't have that luxury of cranial disregard, hence those pesky red eye photographs. So is this what Vincent did to his jailhouse bars? Conveniently disregard them? Painters are not iPhone cameras or TSA scanners. They are closer to what Emil Zola described here. Art is a corner of nature seen through a temperament. There's enough detailed evidence in Vincent's numerous letters for us to believe he was infinitely aware of just exactly what he was doing with a brush in his hands. Nonetheless, there is also an inexpressible quality to his work that justifies its place in the real cultural vernacular and justifies taking Vincent's words at face value. When nature is so beautiful, I am not conscious of myself anymore, and the picture comes to me in a dream. So what is Vincent expressing here? One critic describes Starry Night as the view of an observer on the threshold of eternity. There's certainly a heady concoction of elements. Celestial bodies painted as if they were phosphorescent plankton in a swirling ocean, a church steeple, read religion, completely lost and dwarfed by the larger cosmos. A cypress tree, symbol of death since Roman times, caressing the stars and looking intriguingly similar to another structure that appeared on the scene in the spring of 1889, the Eiffel Tower. A big fan of Walt Whitman, Vincent would have appreciated these lines from Leaves of Grass. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Professor Hope Werness from California State College at Stanislaus has used the term erethistic to describe both Walt and Vincent as persons whose organs and tissues are chronically in a state of abnormal excitement, who tremble and quiver when the rest of us are merely conscious that we are being interested or pleased. So with Starry Night, was Vincent expressing his wonder and awe at the infinite, trembling and quivering there in his asylum cell? Here's one more theory, and I apologize for returning to a medical-based aesthetics, early training, remember? But recent MRI research has equated what occurs in the brains of epileptics with an electrical storm. Nypha and Smith in The Life described Vincent's cognitive condition as if it were a 4th of July fireworks display. A disruptive and destructive one, however. On only two occasions did he write about Starry Night. First, he wrote that it was, quote, just a study of night, and not a very satisfying one at that. Later, he wrote to Theo, once again, I allowed myself to be led astray into reaching for stars that are too big. Another failure and I have had my full of that. Whatever the case, we don't see clouds like these, and we don't see stars like these. But Vincent did. <laughs>